Welcome to the Die Bar of the IWC. Welcome to Wrestling on the Rocks, uh, episode one. Uh, again, I'm at Ref Marsh with me today to talk all things war games. Terrible wrestling takes. Bishop, what's going on, man? What's up, dude? Thanks for having me back. I appreciate coming uh, coming to an episode one again uh, at Tibby Takes Podcast on Twitter and TibbyTakesPodcast.com. Look up Terrible Wrestling Takes. Find an episode. I was just thinking of this. Mm-hmm. I haven't released in forever. I come on here and I spew my terrible wrestling takes. But yeah. because of how things are playing out now with specific characters like a Roman or a Becky Lynch or even how some people talk about a Carmella uh, or a Liv Morgan, you can go back in my catalog and go, hey, was Bishop right? You know, so you can go back to, I don't know, the beginning of Roman coming back and me saying, this is fucking awesome and you're going to love it. You know, and shit like that. So just go back in the catalog and look up some shit. Listen to some shit. It's pretty good. That's true. That's true. It's all in there. What's up, man? How you doing? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's fun. Hour. You know, what's crazy is that we come on here and and even and we don't drink as much in the afternoon because we're responsible adults. Um, yeah. And we tend to have like more actual fun instead of just drunken debauchery. So. Uh, I'm here for it, brother. Yeah, it's a it's a delicate balance for sure. <laughs> oh man, is I I'm just barely starting my coffee. I'm having a little Terramana on my coffee. What you I'm having iced there? tea, just iced, iced tea. tea, regular iced tea. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to do for... a full shot, dude. I just did like a half shot just for the flavor <laughs> in it. Right. No, I made some iced tea for Thanksgiving, um, unsweetened, you know. And uh, whatever. So finish it up to get it out the fridge. Dude, we were traveling a lot during all of this. So uh, SmackDown, if I'm being honest, I did not watch fully. I went through okay. and found a bunch of clips of stuff that was going on. Um, Survivor Series, War Games. War Games! We uh, 
we checked out later on in the evening because we were driving back on Saturday. Um, so by the time we got home, the main event was like three minutes in. So we watched the end of the main event and then just whizzed back to the beginning. A lot of people keep saying, uh, I, you know, what they hate about Peacock is that they can't go back and watch it live once yeah. it started or that once it's over, they have to go. They have to wait for a while for it to post. That's just not true. It's just a malfunction. It's the user. Was it the what we used to call a picnic problem in IT? Problem in chair, not in computer. Mm. You just literally pause it and then you can scroll back as far back as you want. It's like TiVo. It's fine. You just go backwards. Just that's it. <laughs> go backwards. You know what you can also do if it's in if it's an Apple device. You can just tell Siri to go back a couple hours, and she will just whiz back. It's I do it all the time, and it's really easy. And I don't at this point, people complaining about like these weird little idiosyncrasies of Peacock just scream to me uh, someone who's not trying to figure something out. So what they you're saying is that you can't rewind it from live, but you can pause it and then rewind it. No, you can rewind it from live while it's live. You can just push pause and go back. Was it? So you have to push pause. See, I've tried to rewind it without pushing pause, and it doesn't rewind, or it only goes back so far. Oh, but they, I just watch it live. Bar? I just you know watch that it bar on the bottom. Yeah, it doesn't go past a certain point. There's two bars. There's one that you're allowed to, and the other that you're not. You get two bars. I got one. I get two bar. bars, man. Well, I don't have bars, an Apple bars, TV. Bars. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's the problem. Maybe it's I all just the losers it without Apple. Right? Or <laughs> or I can just watch it the next day. Or, you yeah, know, you everything's on demand now. I mean, remember when we were kids? Back in the day, there was this thing called a VCR, you know? Yeah, and legit, if you, if you didn't watch it live, that was it. That was there it. Was no going back. That was it, right? There's yeah. nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Yeah, 100%, man. Oh, let's see here. But I did see a bunch of stuff. Let's start with some some simmering things on SmackDown that have not come back yet because it didn't appear on uh, what one might call WAR GAMES. Yes. Like you said, one. So you're the one to do that. I'll be the twos for that. You make, you're my favorite number, too. So my son sees Solo Sokoa wearing his We The Ones sweatshirt or we the ones t-shirt backwards and i said no bud that's a sweatshirt and it says we the ones on the back so i think daddy might have to get that one <laughs> i know it's so, it's so sick dude <laughs> why is all their merch and fucking sammy's got a new shirt let's skip this and skip the raw sammy's got a new shirt feeling oozy with a question mark oh you fucking yeah. kidding me that's amazing dude and all on right, the back of it i think it still has the number it one still on has the, the one yes mark. The fact people that their logo right now is end. this <laughs> yes. is incredible. <laughs> people want the bloodline to end? Why? <laughs> it's it's the best merch right now. It's insane. Yeah. Dude, there was a while where where I liked Roman. I wasn't like, this is the guy that everyone's ever going to talk about. I just liked him. I thought he was good. I thought he was solid. I wanted to support him. And I remember looking at all the shirts and being like, I don't like any of these shirts. Like Seth Rollins. Yeah. Like, historically awful shirts if seth had decent shirts i'd probably own many yeah because i like him so much but all of his shirts i mean everyone's got their own taste right so i'm not going to be the dude like they suck they're awful they're not my taste i don't in i don't like them i don't want them on my body this mess (laughs) even (laughs) (laughs) but uh uh yeah now, ever since Roman actually came back with uh, Paul Heyman at that backlash and they started doing the show up and win and stack them, smash them, thumb them and gum them. Yeah. Em. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wreck everyone and cream them. Like yeah. <laughs> all those things. I was like, these shirts are all fucking badass. And then it started becoming yeah. like, all right, be careful. Don't buy all of his shirts. <laughs> right, right, right. And now all the bloodline ones. I remember the first bloodline shirt came out and it was all of them around the table and it just said bloodline. And I was like, that's cool, but I'm not big on, like, photos of dudes on my shirts. I'm not even a big fan of the photos of the women on my shirts. Like, I've got a couple shirts like that for really specific reasons. But 
The only for ones the... that really pulled it off were like the KO KO WrestleMania ones. Like he did yeah, the match he card. did the KO Mania three with the match card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a yeah. the Royal Rumble that I went to that says uh, I was here and it's the match card and you can see yeah. all the matches and you go okay cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The first Becky Lynch man shirt I got was the green one that said the man, but it's a picture of her. Because I felt like it would be weird for me to be walking around with a shirt that just says the man. I'm like, it's only cool because a woman is the man. I get that. I wanted a Becky Lynch shirt for so long, but they all said the last kicker, and I didn't feel comfortable with a man as a man wearing a shirt that said the last kicker as if I was That's a good point. Yeah, woman beater. Was, right. Right. It's been tough. It's been tough. Right. I wanted to buy the man shirts for my girlfriend. I'm like, you could wear this and it's dope. A woman's wearing a shirt that says the man can spark a conversation, right? Uh but yeah. All that to say, the Bloodline shirts the, right now are fucking can't miss. Real quick, the man shirt is the only wrestling shirt I wear in public that people give me props for. That's Every cool. other one, they just like look past it, no matter what it is. The man one, people stop me. I went to, I was in Philadelphia. I walked a half a block to the crosswalk, across the street, up the entire block to a store, then halfway back to my car. Just in that two block thing, five people said something to me. About Did how, they all know who cool Becky Lynch was? was? Yes. Okay. Yes. And they didn't all seem like wrestling fans. So dope. Yeah. Blood I thought it might be like a My Bullet God. Club problem where a lot of people liked the Bullet Club shirts because they thought it was about guns. They had no idea how to do with wrestling. And so right. there was a guy every now and again, I stopped saying it to people. Um, I mean, especially prior to AEW, I would see shirts with a Bullet Club and I'd be like, oh, that shirt's too sweet, man. And they'd go, ah. Right. They'd be like, what a fucking weirdo. This nerd is throwing hand signs at me. And I was all like, eh? Because I'm like wearing like a fucking Shinsuke shirt or something. I'm like, come on, you know, like, eh. And there's like, right. mm, I don't know what the fuck. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? It took me a while <laughs> to figure out it's because they saw a, a gun club shirt, basically, except now there's a gun club too. So they saw uh, what they believed to be a pro firearm shirt in a hot topic and said, this is dope. <laughs> right because those two things go together <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah all right smackdown my bad time. sidetrack derail the show <laughs> yeah where's our chat oh, fuck bunch of losers out there stupid splinter fox splinter fox actually came through i was recording with uh, hey. medusa recently a quick shout out to medusa paving the way five minute mondays trash talk it's all there go to youtube.com slash queen of carnage uh splinter fox was in the chat and helping us out because one of the, the mods we had in my ear was all like, oh, your stuff is all glitching and doing all this crazy stuff. And I was like, I'm not on my side. And then we Splinter Fox is in the chat helping us out. This is what we're seeing. We're like, fuck yeah, Splinter Fox. Yeah. Got my back. <laughs> I trust this guy. He might As not like should. me, but he doesn't want me to look bad either. No. <laughs> <laughs> he might not support everyone that comes on your show, yeah. but yeah, he's, he's a supporter nonetheless. So speaking Smackdown. of derailing the show, but so a couple things that did happen in SmackDown specifically worth noting that did not come back later on because of the way of the world. Um, Butch versus Santos. This was not where. Is this the one where Joaquin was dressed like Pee Wee Herman, or was that the week? No, before? that was the week before. What a fucking! Why would he do that? Anyways, Santos versus Butch. What'd you think? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what you thought of it because I didn't get to watch that match. Oh. Yeah, it was great. It was great. I think they're giving this is so this is what's happening with Santos, which is phenomenal. Um, he is presented and executing the way we all thought Andrade would. He is he's not missing on any match. I mean, so it was a while ago and I don't necessarily remember the whole thing. So um, as Grim Reaper yeah. says in the chat, Santos versus Butch was fun because uh, it was. I mean, it's it's what you expect out of both of them. They did some good spots. Um, where but but knowing was doing and how good they are and thing like that yeah it was yeah. I tell you what it wasn't it wasn't as good as it could have been I gave okay. you that it, so they it left something on the table yes a thousand percent yes and they even but they delivered they they delivered to a flaw there was a spot on the on the top rope where I thought maybe a Spanish fly would happen and Santos was just waiting for Butch to break his fingers you know what I mean so like it was something like you know so yes to your point. They gave us a solid match, but there was way more that we're, we can see later, for sure. That's a good thing. I think yes. that's ultimately a good thing. So, 
Uh, good, good. And I saw the uh, Santos won, which means we're eventually going to get Santos. Do you think? Do you think they're going to let Braun? Oh wait, we got there, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yes, and you okay. were correct, sir. I called it right. The two for one yep. special. Yep. Let me see right here. Ricochet pin Strowman. Yeah, because remember I said last week that I felt we were going to get a two for one special the um the brutes were gonna or the imperium was gonna cost braun the match ricochet would would win then we can get ricochet versus santos one of those against gunther plus still carry on the story of braun versus gunther yep. so now we have basically three people that should be going up against gunther yeah that's how that played yeah. out it was brilliant it was brilliant and was me calling it so far in advance did it spoil it for you at all no it, it didn't it didn't because they sold it so well and the match still ended in a disbelief. And yeah. it, it ended with um, a definitive win for Ricochet. But also, if this didn't happen, Ricochet wasn't going to win. So it's it didn't – Braun didn't look like a fool. Uh, Braun accepted his defeat. And Ricochet versus Santos is now the next step. There is no – clouded area there you know so like mm -hmm. even like you know sometimes it'll happen and be like oh fuck man this had to happen so this doesn't even feel that way it didn't feel that way to braun didn't feel that way to ricochet ricochet wasn't pissed that he had to win that way none of that so the fact that it all came off that way in unison um there was no sour taste at all that's awesome yeah uh the viking raiders defeated hit row was this a squash match yes man feel kind of bad for Hit Row. They just showed up. I mean, they weren't dumpster dive, you know, like yeah. <laughs> on, on Raw. <laughs> so on Raw, I missed the Street Profits Alpha Academy match. Yeah. And then I saw the promo in the back where Gable was like, and Otis didn't even get a chance to take off his shirt. So I went back and watched it. And the match is like 15 minutes long. <laughs> so I was like, wait a second. I, I thought he didn't have enough time to take off his shirt. He had plenty of time to take off his shirt. Yeah. He decided not to. Right, right, but it wasn't it wasn't as good as that match. Let's put it that way. All right. I mean, I'm excited to see Viking Raiders back be dominant. I like the addition of Sarah Logan looking like a maniac. I like all that stuff. So I'm not I'm it's never going to be upset about Viking Raiders being dominant and badass. But it is peculiar timing when you think about them trying to build LDF, Hit Row, Imperium, the the um uh uh. Judgment Day and all of them. Like, there's ones that are all there kind of, like, trying to get their footing still. You know, Judgment Day is a little further along for sure. But, like, they're all there. Then the Viking Raiders come out and just goes, we'll just fucking destroy all of them real quick. And you go, right. well, we don't know if these ones are good yet. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there's that. But the big thing that happened on um, SmackDown was Bray Wyatt and L.A. Knight. What is Bray Wyatt's problem? L.A. Knight said they're even. He said they're squared up and now Bray <laughs> still got this beef. Like, what's going on, man? They two for one special. Even. You got lucky. No, they, they were weren't even. even. And then it was a two for one special. Yeah, but a two for one special is still even. You got lucky, is what it was. Not everyone gets lucky with a two for one. You know, I love it. So yeah. Keep it going. Keep it going. I did I did think uh, and there was a I started listening to more podcasts again about the wrestling stuff. Um because people stop hating across the board about this this stuff. Um, they're not necessarily guessing too far forward. So the possibility of Bray wrestling on uh, uh, Saturday was appealing, but they didn't set the matchup. So uh, I do like how they are. They're, they're not showing that it's Bray doing this. They're mm -hmm. leaving it up to the entity. Um, the external expression if you will so whether it's uncle howdy or what have you um because even you had said it last week i believe it was on episode one that the howdy mask was the one that took la night and it wasn't it was another figured mask it wasn't the same howdy uh persona so whatever oh, oh, oh you're thinking of like the long kind of like almost stone looking one versus the cowboy mask there's two masks for one guy i think so Oh, wait, I no, thought Bray it, wore the one. So there was there was when when he opens the door to go outside, 
that yeah. mask that's out there is like generic druid mask. I'm going to pull it up right now because if I remember correctly, when, when Bray made his return, wait, he came out without the mask at all. Didn't, didn't he have right. it and take it off? Yeah. Or no. He had, it, he had a mask on and took it off. And it had like the weird Wario I don't, Luigi I don't know. mustache. It's not that important, though. I, I I just think that there's more to it than just the howdy thing, and we'll end up getting there. Um, but mm-hmm. when you get time, go back and look at that clip, and you'll see that there's a, a different character mask out there. But it, it looks like mask? generic druid. It looks like a generic druid mask. Yeah, it doesn't... Is it, oh, I grab the dogs. I thought it was the cowboy boy howdy mask. Hmm... Mm. Uh. It's harder to find when you're trying to find it. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> Pull it out. Pull it out. Do this. All right. All right. I'm done. I'm looking at this thing. Oh, let's see in the chat real quick. Necro Eric says, big shout out to Independent Wrestling Television and Wrestling Open plus Limitless GCW and the good stuff this upcoming weekend. Sure. Who's Necro Eric? I have no idea. No idea. But, you know, cheers to them coming through. Cheers. Um, Thanks for joining the chat. Next time, can you say, hey, great show, guys, and then say all that stuff? (laughs) (laughs) Although tomorrow we're going to talk some about it uh, because AAA is coming to my town and there's going to be some pretty cool shit. So uh, we're going to talk about that, too. Uh, But, yeah, overall, the Bray Wyatt and Ellie Knight story continuing, I'm pretty fucking thrilled with. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. I got it. I'm looking at it. The mask. That was the original mask. It's not the cowboy one. It was the original one that used to show up. So I think that's the mask that Boy Howdy wears. Which is also a mask over a face, clearly. Right. All right. You remember what I'm talking about? The original Bray Wyatt teases. It was that weird mask that had the Wario Luigi thing. It's that mask. Okay. I so don't I disagree still... with you. I thought it was something else. Shit out of here. Next. But, but that is the one that, like, when it took off, it was the, it was Howdy Boy after that. And you go, okay. Um, so, yeah, it's two masks for one person because the person under. Ah, two for It's one like Tony one. Clifton. It's like two, it's like the Tony Clifton thing. You know what I mean? It's not supposed to be a mask. Just clearly people don't talk like that without a mask being in the way. <laughs> okay. So, all right, but we got more Bray, more Ellie Knight. I was surprised they didn't build that into uh, War Games and get yeah. something out of it. Yeah. Uh, but they did not, so it's going to keep going. I'm not totally shocked that we're dragging it on even longer because I feel like Bray is the king of the slow play. He's like, I've got an idea to introduce something. It's only going to take 11 weeks. <laughs> and they go, yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect for what we do. <laughs> Uh, so there's that, but I'm excited about it. Stoked for this, uh, SmackDown to see more. The fact that we're getting Ellie Knight consistently on TV, proving what he can do, proving that he is not outmatched next to a Bray when it comes to talking. Yeah. Is already phenomenal. Yeah. He's holding up his end of the bargain. Not like even like Roman, when he had to do it originally, um, you know, that panic freak out that most people do against Bray where, you know, their emotions kind of unravel. LA Knight's not doing that. He's he's supporting his own character and delivering his own promos or his own side of this in a, in a more confident tone, a more understood character tone. Yes. Yes. All right, let's move on to Survivor Series. I got a question for you about Survivor Series. Um, just the essence of. It's called Survivor Series correct yes do you remember how much shit we would give survivor series battle of the brand supremacy no because i loved it well the shit that we would talk was how there was no stakes yeah Yeah. right like battle for brand supremacy only makes sense if at the end of it you go we're number one all year right 
Like right. even uh, U of A and ASU, they have a territorial cup. Right. Where every time one of them somebody gets it. it. Yeah, they get it. It's yeah. a territory cup. So there was yeah. a it was big, big in our in our little town here, Tucson, when U of A won that cup back because we hadn't had it since like twenty sixteen. So it's like we finally got it back. ASU is not kicking our ass anymore. They will probably next year. We're not very good at football. But <laughs> like there was there's something there, right? Right. This one, they said, hey, we're not doing Battle of the Brand Supremacy. And I was like, okay, that could be fun. I still like champion versus champion. I like how um catered this pay-per-view is specifically uh historically has been for the casual fan although it started with you know five battle to survive right it was it was catchier when they said it yeah and they would come up with these teams every year on why they wanted to you know team up and take out these people and it was elimination style match this one had none of it and I know that there's been critiques about people saying it didn't need it. Where would it be if you did another five on five match? Then you've got like fucking 30 people in three matches. Like I get that. But I really don't understand why we're calling it like this is reverse hell in a cell as a yeah. pay-per-view. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. When we call a pay-per-view hell in a cell and we have six or seven hell in a cell matches, we say, all right, it's a gimmick match. Why are we naming it after enforcing all these people in this match? Well, we made this Survivor Series a gimmick match subtitle and took out the gimmick match that the pay-per-view is actually named after premium live event at this point so for me like i kind of felt like it shouldn't have been called survivor series at all this was the least yeah. survivor series survivor series we've ever seen whether or not i think that the stakes should have been there or there was ways to re repair it this just felt ill-named it was like that one year there was yeah. an extreme rules pay uh premium live event and there was only one or the tlc tlc a few years back if you remember there was one match with like chairs and it was like why is this even called this right this is what this felt like by the end of it i really enjoyed the whole thing but i think that you either need to put in an elimination style match or rename it just say hey in november we do a war games pay-per-view premium line event yeah I, I i actually agree i think if this was called SummerSlam war games or um you know great balls of fire war games or what have you, or like you said, just a standalone war games pay-per-view. It's the same pay-per-view, nothing premium live event. Nothing would look different. Nothing would change. Nothing would feel different. Um, yeah. I, I didn't mind the, the survivor series connotation though, because I guess just because of the time of year, it really fit that way because it was the Saturday after Thanksgiving, you know, mm -hmm. it just, it kind of vibed all the same. So I could see if we want to give one last bit of leeway to Triple H, that part of his particular style of making a reset, he's interweaving the old while bringing in the new. I would imagine that that TLC pay-per-view could now be a War Games pay-per-view. So next year, War Games is in December. Survivor Series is in November. If you want to fantasy book it out that way. Um, I, I, but I agree. I mean, it did lose something, yes. but I don't think it lost enough to, to really like pick a knit at that one. Correct. You know what I would have called it? Starcade war games. Cause they own that shit too, man. Yeah. yeah. And that was the other original Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving one. Yeah. Show. I would have yeah. just renamed it. Say, Hey, we're not having survivor series this year. We're bringing back Starcade. We're bringing back War Games because War Games was also Dusty's thing. Like, lean the fuck in. If you're Triple H and you say, hey, I kind of don't like what we've been doing with Survivor Series. I kind of want to shelf it. Then shelf it. Yeah. Don't sort of rebrand it, but not. Like, just say, hey, you know what? New uh, new COO, who dis? New PLE, who dis? I can just right. do it. So I, I would have done that. Just gone full bore, hey, we're dropping Survivor Series this year. It's Starcade this year. It's War Games. It's this. We're we are are going all in on our history and the history we have access to, and expressing how important all that history is. And with that in mind, the commentary of AJ Styles and Finn Balor did so much of that. And I want to bring that up. I know that the first match was the women's War Games match, and we are going to talk about that. But I do want to bring up because we were talking about the history of it all, the way that. Michael Cole was able to talk about all the history of the Bullet Club, of things that happened in NJPW, 
of um, AJ and Finn Balor, him not mincing words about it, saying exactly what and where and when, to me was the perfect way, and people aren't going to give him credit for this, to talk about another company historically without asserting yourself as better than or asserting them as less than. It was just a fact of the matter is this is historical for these reasons. And I feel like a lot of people talk about, oh, when you're number one, you don't talk about number two. And when you're number two, you got to tear down number one and all that shit, right? And we've complained about it ourselves, about how much of AEW has become them making these references and then looking at the camera like, get it, get it. We're talking about WWE, get it. And you just go, okay, fucking move on. I get it. Right. This was a cool way of them just saying, like, no, historically speaking, this is important, and this is why. This thing's happened in these other places, you know? And I thought it was just an awesome way to acknowledge history, not talk down to the fans, and also not be winking at the camera and not asserting yourself as better than. So it was the perfect delivery of that to me. I was like, this is amazing. Like, it felt fluid and natural and, and I don't know, awesome. Did you catch any of that? Yeah, I thought. To, I, I think to the larger point, AJ, no. Nah, commentary itself has been given the freedom to tell more stories. There's mm-hmm. less, oh, ah, what a move. Like, there's less of that and more here is what's happening and where it possibly came from. Um, and if that's, if that's a caveat of, uh, what's his name? Vince not being there, then fantastic. You know. Um, yeah. So yeah, in this match specifically, I was more in tune with the action around the ring. That I mean, I guess you kind of know this too, and uh, maybe even shitting on my own analysis of you because um, you just spoke about the commentary. I tend to watch matches and create my own commentary because. Mm-hmm. I necessarily don't, I I don't always agree, but that's why when I spoke on the Corey Graves helping Kevin Patrick along, like when it is noticeable, it's noticeable. So to your point, I did catch some of it, but I kind of tune out because the AJ Finn story has been so all over the place, you know, bitter enemies for so long. Well, not really. They just missed each other many, many times. Yeah. So, you know, they, they had one match in New Japan. One match, and it was yeah. a triple. It was a tri- uh, three on three match, six man tag match. Yep, and that's it. Yep, and then they had the one singles match in WWE, and that's it. Until yeah. Survivor and that was accidental. Series. Yeah, yeah. So their careers have been parallel, but not so. So that that yeah, that whole story of the bullet club and all this shit, it doesn't always add up the way it's told, especially from the IWC. I, I, I can't stand how they talk about it as if they oh, yeah, were, yeah, there was yeah. a fight for it. No, it was AJ has said it on multiple podcasts. If you're a fan of AJ and want to listen to him talk and tell his story, he goes, yeah, you know, his, his last day was my first day or my last day was his first day. I forgot who came first, but yeah. um, it was like, it, it literally was a, a, here you go. See you later. That's it. That yeah, is it was the definition of parallel. Yes. Like, there was no, no, at all, you know? So, anyway, I, I tend to tune out when that story is told in particular because it's it's usually just wrong from what AJ has said. So, uh, so no, but I loved the match, and it, was, it went exactly how I thought it was going to be, uh, or I, I hoped it would be because I didn't think they would do it, but I was glad that they got the interactions from the outsides quick and got those guys out of the way and let AJ and Finn have an awesome match. And to your point about Santos and uh, Pete Dunn or Butch, they uh, they still left more on the table, man. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be great, and that gives us the uh, one and one. So we there's a need for a rubber match, but that's kind of what I meant about the way that Michael Cole explained it all. Was it wasn't like, hey, these guys have been bitter enemies for so long. It was their careers have been so similar for so long with such a similar style. Uh, that it has been that proverbial dream match that has always just missed. He's here, he's there. He's here, he's there. And then they kept, but because their stories were also so almost linear, that it was like, how have they never crossed paths is incredible. And so the idea of like, 
we're on this trajectory where now they are intertwined for the first time in these long careers where we kept saying, please, someone put them together. Right. You know what I mean? And so I thought, and at fucking 46 and 41. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And Absolutely. they're both in incredible shape. <laughs> yeah. And the the Bullet Club history makes it so important, too, because it's like it's not that one battled the other one for it. It's just one inherited it through a an organic story after the other one organically had to leave it. So right. it becomes this whole like, oh, man, if only at the same time they could have had that power struggle. Like, you know what I mean? And I felt like yeah. that that kind of came across in the commentary of all like. It's kind of like a in a way like how Hogan Flair was for a long time in the early 90s and stuff. Flair being top of WCW and Hogan being top of WWF. Like, wh- what if you used to see magazines all the time that would say the dream match that'll never happen? And it was them. And, right, right. You know, the fantasy booking was always like, oh, can you imagine getting them in the ring together? And then when they finally did, it was. Not what but I mean. even the tease of the path along the way. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I thought I thought I just thought it was awesome. This was like so riddled in storytelling of story that what could have been. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or what may be. I mean, they did say on Raw that they ended it, or at least that's what AJ was saying, that as this culminates tonight, this will be the end of it. And then the club loses. So if they end up wrestling again, then that turns the club into bad guys for not holding their word. X, Y, Z there. But point being, I think there's a lot more juice out of the two of them. I think so too. And I think that we're going to see them go and come back. I think it's going to be like, Hey, let's go our separate ways for now. And then it's going to be like, Hey, wait, this other thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe SummerSlam next year. Yeah. Or maybe a stare down in the rumble teases for something. Maybe we actually do something with the, with the, with mania and the two of them. What else are they doing? You know, a Finn and yeah, AJ mania an match. Hell of an yeah. opener on night two. Could be. And I would hope that it would end in a Rochambeau. <laughs> anything but a kick in the dick <laughs> uh let's see i just want to talk about the singles matches and then we're gonna talk about the two war games matches i think kind of side by side uh ronda versus shotzi it hurt hurt the watch i felt like there's something missing from shotzi's presentation for sure the crowd was asleep for this, and Rhonda even made note of it in a weird way, I felt like, because she's even like, you hear all that silence? It's because they don't care about you. It's like, well, you're also in the ring, and they're the champion. They should care if you're going to win or not. But the crowd was really dead on this one, which is another thing that's funny. Is I've, I was uh, listening to some other podcasts where they're talking about how, which match was it in War Games that they said... I think AJ and Finn, they said that they believe that they were piping in noise. And this goes back again to where it's like, you can't have the same pay-per-view or the same show, the same premium live event, the same company, piping in noise for one and not piping in noise for another one. Say the crowd's right. dead for this one, and this one, it's so loud, but the crowd looks dead to me, so they must be piping it in. How inconsistent and narcoleptic is your sound engineer if they're only right. doing it for certain things, right? So right. to me, I think that the conversation stops there. Once you go to Ronda Shotzi and go, oh, the crowd's dead on this one? Well, then they're clearly not piping in noise because there's no right. reason why they wouldn't pipe in noise for a champion versus a random grudge match. You know what I mean? Right, right. So immediately I was all like, bah. Uh, Although there is rumor that, and I mean, I'm pretty sure that people have footage of it somewhere, but... um that during the Ronda Shotzi match, the crowd started chanting Sasha, Sasha Banks. I heard it. They, yeah. And they're I saying that they brought the noise level down because of that. But so if you bring the mics down and then you hear someone in the match saying, do you hear how there's no noise? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I look, I've, I've been it. to live events. I'm sure you've been to live events. I know you've been to live events. How many yeah. times have you heard a pocket of fans try to get a chant started and the rest of the crowd go, you guys are fucking idiots and not chant along. Yep. Or change that's, the chant that's, altogether. Right. Yeah. That's most likely what happened. I mean, even when I went to um, extreme rules in Philly this last time, they tried to chant CM Punk. There was like three rows that tried to do it. And everyone yep. else was like, yeah, no, this doesn't, this doesn't happen anymore. So yeah, yeah it, it, it happened. It still happens. So I would imagine that's what that was. Just a that's loud section. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought. Uh, which is also funny because uh, I was at one, the Royal Rumble 2019 Raw, 
right afterwards and my section started singing to bailey during the ronda match hey, hey, hey. Won't you, uh, you know and it was clearly not the other half of the arena it was just this one section and as this one section realized other sections weren't picking up the entire section collectively just got louder <laughs> and it was so cool because <laughs> we're all like fuck you all we're doing this and it's getting on camera it was so great. and you, if you go back and watch that match uh i don't know how much of it was they were at commercial break or not and i think i have a picture of it somewhere but there was moments where bailey's looking in the crowd like concerned like i'm really supposed to be putting over ronda here and you guys are yeah really no, i remember that i remember yeah. that yeah 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 she was almost like please stop <laughs> yeah i mean i've I think Shotzi has has a character appeal, a physical a physical look to her that no one else does that yes. makes her extremely important to wrestling. Yes. She has a really bad time wrestling. She's yeah. she's athletic, she's talented. She has a really bad time wrestling. And I don't know I, I don't know how else to say it because I'm not in the business, I'm not a professional. But just like in the music industry, I don't make music, but I know good music when I hear it. Like, yeah, that the wrestling part of it, like she's fuck, man, I, I don't want to say it. But the best way I can relate it is she's not good. And you know what there, I feel like you might tell me if you agree with this. This is kind of what I my takeaway was. You're still wrestling like it's a VFW because, right. quote, that's what got you to the dance or this is me and I'm being true to me. And there's a certain aspect of to get to another level you have to switch into another gear so you know what i mean so here's the problem like that's what's and like. i don't i don't disagree with that the problem is from her debut on nxt when i was watching nxt religiously she was making the same mistakes she's making today yes and in nxt her best pocket to sit in was when she hosted halloween havoc by herself the entire ride yeah. to that and even how it kind of unfolded. She was on point. She loves her character. She loves her Shotzi. She loves the makeup of it. And when she gets to be that authentically on screen, it works. But when yeah. she steps out of that character to start wrestling with other wrestlers, there's a problem. And if these other wrestlers can't carry her to the spot she wants to put on, it looks even worse. Yeah. To the other half of this match in Ronda, that I I almost don't want to go back and watch her debut match at WrestleMania. Because the fond memories everybody has of that match, like, will that veil then come undone? And I'll go, oh, she's not, she was never a good wrestler, or will I miss that version of Ronda so much that I just won't be a fan anymore. I keep hoping with Rhonda that it'll turn back around. But how does it turn back around? Who can turn her back around? Something has to change. Because at this point, like I said about Sashi, Sa Shotzi, Rhonda's not good. Her performances are not good. The stuff she's doing with Shayna in character presentation is a hundredfold what she's been over the last three years, character-wise. Mm -hmm. It looks so much better. Inside those fucking ropes, man, it is a problem. It is a problem. I feel like it was almost like watching two rookies. It felt like this could have been an NXT match without a title. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. Because there's one thing here we, we are pretty well established, and that's that we do not enjoy Charlotte Flair. But one thing I will say about Charlotte Flair, no matter how good or bad i believe she is or you think she is or how tough it is for us to watch the match if you're listening to the crowd by the end of all her matches no matter how sloppy or how weird that crowd is on fire for the finish they have definitively decided who they want to win and who they don't and to me that's the mark of someone who's very well versed and to be honest it's the best quality about her that she whether whether whatever she's doing in ring She's finding a way to get the crowd to connect to what's happening in at least those pockets of moments, right? And this was a match with two people who don't know how to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, know, shout out to Charlotte, I guess. But, uh, yeah, this was this felt like two people who aren't sure how to connect with the crowd from two people who 
on paper should be connecting to the crowd almost effortlessly. Well, and that's right. And that's the thing the the pro in the match would have in, and this is in context, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a fucking booker, but the pro in the match, knowing that the crowd's not responding would have slowed everything down, eliminated spots, turned it into some type of maneuver situation where even Rhonda could have been like, hey, Shotzi, do this to me. It's something that I can't really move out of, and we'll sit there for 30 seconds. You know, like Maybe. I mean, I'm not working enough to, gain... to say this is how you do it. But well, that's what I'm saying, but find a way happened. to take control. Find a way to yeah. take control of the match instead of moving on to the next spot. Yeah, they should have feel never... pretty... Yeah, like, okay, well, they're not responding. Let's go to the next thing. Let's do the next thing. No, yeah. eliminate some shit and, and get there safely. Get there in yeah. a way that the crowd has an idea that anything happened, but Shane now all we have like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. At SummerSlam. Remember yes. he started, the crowd was not into it. And as soon as they started getting, like they tried to count along to the beat to the Bowery, he yeah. stopped. I went, no. And because he was all like, you guys haven't been into anything and you want right. to count along. Guess what? Right. I'm not doing this. And got the whole crowd to boo. Then he did something else to get them to tease that they would be sing along. And then, took that away too and the crowd started booing again and they're like fuck Seamus he's not letting us do what we want and then that's all he needed he needed you to say fuck Seamus because now yeah. we're in it we got you right now right. we're getting Damien over right. but yep. he knew that like to get to Damien going over the crowd has to be along and so he's like let me do a few things to take something away right yeah um I mean even that spot with the front row being taken out was so VFW phony these four chairs that are extending out into the walkway where no one else is sitting with these giant people yeah. sitting in the brand new merch with the fucking hologram sticker still on it. And you go, oh. And Plans. then at least one of them tweeted yeah. a bunch of stuff like, how cool was this? I got to be a part of the show. <laughs> it's like an indie wrestler in the area. And I was like, it's cool, yes. But yeah. also part of it was like the, the spot looked phony enough as it was. And then they went from that immediately into the finish and it was just, the match did not work, man. And these are two right. people who I think on paper should be a shoe in to the audience to want one to win and want one not yeah. to. Yeah. Like this if is anything. Easy... Yeah. If anything, have the attention of the audience and they could give a fuck less. They could. Yeah. And that's what to yeah. me, something is missing from both their presentations. And I don't know what it is. I'm not a pro, but these are also two talent that I like a lot. So yeah. it's like a bummer to watch something like that and go. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Uh Austin Theory defeats Seth Rollins and Bobby Lashley to become the champion in almost the exact way that we predicted it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, except I thought Bobby would win. Um, so watching uh, Theory win this, I was like, you know what? And it was done so well. It was done you so well. You thought Bobby was going to win. I thought Theory was going to win. Yeah, and yeah, I told yeah, yeah. Exactly how. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm yeah. amazing. Well, <laughs> you were correct, sir. <laughs> yeah. You can't count the three. No, but, but not at all. But I have no idea how to count. <laughs> uh, no, it was great. It was great. Probably, uh, I, I can't say match of the night because the War Games matches were pretty good. <laughs> but it was fucking but, awesome. <laughs> it so was really good. I would good. <laughs> say that the, the men's War Games match was probably story of the night, but I would think yeah. Triple Threat was the match of the night because one of the things that I noticed in this Triple Threat was this was right after Ronda Shotzi when the crowd was properly dead. They were not into the beginning of this match. They were really into Seth. And as you watch these three dudes do, they did exactly what I was just talking about with the other ones. They did right. enough. Right, engage with the get, crowd, get them up and yep. going. Yeah. And the crowd was on fire by the end of this match. They yeah. wanted it so bad. So this was amazing. And it, it's, I mean, I kind of credit that one to Seth. I'm not saying Bobby and theory are bad by any means but i feel like seth has the innate ability as much as he goes out there and oh whoa and it's a good starting crowd, point though you can't yes. you can't deny it as as a as a good starting point though if you want to reset no. the crowd it's a good starting point but i'm saying he's not just a conductor of them singing his song once that music turns off he's still conducting that crowd he is fucking good he knows exactly what it takes to get them behind whoever they've got to. He's a master when you watch a match like this, I think. Um, and the other guys are amazing and great listeners and, and bring a lot to the table too. I'm not trying to discount them, but 
Seth feels like kind of like a maestro. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I definitely felt like it was fucking fantastic, though. I mean, it was. Yeah, it was so good. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was great. And I do think that theory winning makes a ton of sense. I know a lot of people are like, if he was going to win here, then why have him lose the thing? And it was so stupid. What a dumb take. To make you fucking <laughs> care. To make you care. Look at the promo that happened on Raw. And to shift his character. Yes. He went from cocky kid who's had this accomplishment to ah ha 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 ha. I win whenever I want to. Mm -hmm. I'll fucking show you that I have the grit and will to win whenever I want. That's a big fucking difference. Big difference. Huge. Yeah. And it's not believable without adversity. Yes. Yeah, he couldn't have just switched on all of a sudden. He needed to make a he needed a big loss to get pissed and put a chip on his shoulder and say and even like he said, I'm tired of being the the youngest to do anything. I want to be taking the now as it is cuz before it was all like, "Ah, I'm the youngest to do this, I'm the youngest to do that," you know. Right. Um yeah, like you said. Uh all right, so it does bring us to the two war games matches. The women's opened up the show, the men's closed the show. We're going to open with the women's um war games match. Yeah, man, I feel like the yeah, sandwiching the two war games matches I think was good and smart. I would have called it Star Starcade. <laughs> what do you think about this? A lot of people have issues with weapons, the weapons in the match that you know you're trying to get the time advantage, and instead of going in there and getting an extra two minutes to to punch, uh, let's see, Bailey in the face a few times, instead you go running under the ring and you spend two and a half minutes getting garbage cans in the ring. Yeah. 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 I get it. I get it. Do you think all the weapons take away from the war games match? I think they play a great part inside the ring. I do enjoy when they're used. Mm -hmm. If. I mean, what's the other way to do it? Have them set up on the outside here. You get to take these in here. You get to take those in. So. Or just not use weapons at all and say that the structure itself is the weapon. But even then, we've taken that away from Hell in a Cell years ago. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it well, used to be so the, the structure. So the, the part of the, the one rule in war games that makes that access of weapons unique is that you can't leave the cage. You leave the cage, you're disqualified. Yeah. So since that rule is in place, they have to grab these weapons beforehand. I tell you, there is a hook with these weapons. Mm-hmm. They grab the kendo sticks. They go to grab a chair. They go to step in. As soon as they step back off the the steps, the crowd goes nuts. So yeah. it works. So I I do yes. It there is a problem with how long it takes, but I do think they play a great piece in the match. I mean, we've seen some awesome spots, you know. Yeah. I don't have a big problem with the weapons in there. I do totally get the concept of why people think that the structure should be the weapon. But like I said, we've taken that away from every other structure already. Because Hell in a Cell originally was no one in, no one out. The structure is hell. The hell is being stuck inside that that cage, right? Well, that steel cage match was also... First match. Yeah. That rule was broken. First, first but <laughs> they also didn't use weapons in the first match. They got out right. and then they showed by getting out and doing the other destruction around it and diving right. off showed the idea of this the structure is a, weapon. Is, right. is a weapon. You know what right. I mean? Right. Um, steel uh, cage, like you said, the guys used to get wrapped general. up in it and all that yeah. stuff when it was the big blue and all that. Yeah. Yeah. They used to like rub their face in it and get yeah. bloody, like yeah. all that stuff. We, I think with the lack of blood, it's required an induction of weapons because we need some sort of visualization of violence that the blood used to provide in and of itself right. by itself being bloody goes, Ooh, this is dangerous. But since there is no blood, the sound of a cracking piece of metal or wood, people go, Ooh, you know right. what I mean? Right. So yeah, I don't totally agree with like no weapons in the match would make the structure seem more of the weapon i think that they did enough spots with it as it was that it was fine i think having no roof on it already undoes the war games thing to begin with yep 
Um, and and without the weapons, the only hardest part or w- weapon they have is that center divider. Yeah. That you know still gets used as as a weapon itself too. Though I think it's fine. I really think it's fine. And to Triple H's point, not having the roof on it isn't necessarily about just getting people to jump off. It is about angles and cameras and athletic mm-hmm. ability of the performers anyway. So that amazing shot they have at the end of the men's uh, or during the men's war games match of the five on five in each ring, that doesn't happen with that cage there, you know, and there was no weapons in the way when they took that picture. So, I mean, there's, I actually hate that shot. Do you? I hate it. Did you see Seamus's comment to it? Cause no. be yourself stand out. Cause he's just That's one fine. pale dot in the whole thing. <laughs> 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 But back to the uh, women's though. I don't want to get too sidetracked. You know, I'm yeah. a little limited today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did like it overall, though. I really thought it was really good. Um, do you think my hunch in the women's is Bianca buckled her knee and Bianca was supposed to do something off the top? And I, I believe, with no information whatsoever, I'm just a drunk idiot on YouTube. I believe that Becky jumping off was an audible because EO jumps down. Bianca's knee seems to buckle. She talks to the ref for a minute. She lays down flat. You can see her trying to move her foot. Yeah. She's trying to make sure she has mobility. Um, and the camera did its best to not show you that Becky and Bianca were talking for quite some time. Wait, so production value added to the match instead of obviously taking away from it some of the times there was a yeah. couple shots there was one shot specifically where bailey took a massive bump and the camera zoomed in on her face right as she turned and went oh, no, no. <laughs> 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 calling a spot to someone the other way so as soon as she hits she doesn't even like her eyes aren't even closed she's just like <laughs> and i was like so but those those are those are issues everywhere. Yeah, but, that was more. That was more just me shitting on AEW because oh, for they sure. they always show it. They show all of it always. Yeah. Um. But you kind of see Bianca roll towards Becky. Camera cuts away. You're seeing a bunch of stuff. And when they come back to that side of the cage minutes later, you can still see Becky and Bianca looking at each other. And you're just like, they've been talking for a while. That's when they put everybody up on those tables and Becky does the leg drop. My belief is that that leg drop was an audible. And that it was supposed to be Bianca doing something spectacular because they want the shot. They even said beforehand, we need a lot of main roster shots here, which is, I think, why they had so many weapons. I think it's why they did the mm-hmm. the top shot the way they did. They want to be able to promote it next year and have stuff of top current talent as opposed to a bunch of AEW talent and people who didn't make it to the main roster in general. You know right. what I mean? Like right. That's all they have from NXT. Right. The first three war games in NXT were revolved around the Undisputed Era and Authors of Pain. Right. The fuck is what? What do you? <laughs> it, I wouldn't have made that call myself. But... Well, that was the story of the Undisputed Era. Yeah. 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 That was their whole thing. So. Yeah. Uh, with but that no, in mind, I, thought, well, I thought it went awesome. I, I thought it was great. And again, I'll shit on AEW real quick. Um. I watched full gear and then right after this match, I go, this is, this was better than anything I saw on full gear. And I, it's just got, it's gotta be a production thing. Um, but it might not be that this, it was just, it was great. It was, it was just fucking, I, every, every performer in there and even, even Bianca uh, to her credit, which I know I, I shit on her a little bit here and there, but every performer in there was perfect. You know, like, yes, some things could have been a little tighter, but like Asuka and Rhea, again, had great spots. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What else do you say? It's just fucking awesome. There was one moment of the of the show where I went. It's kind of cool watching everyone play with their friends right now. Yeah. in (laughs) In the corner was Nikki Alexa, Asuka and EO, Bianca and and uh, uh, Bailey. Oh, Bailey. Bailey, yeah. And then um, Rhea and... Who was it? I think it was Rhea and Dakota. Because it was before... Um, oh, yeah. It was before Becky was in there. And I think before Mia. Or was it... 
Rhea and Mia. I think it was Rhea and Mia. I don't know. But it was like that. It was all paired off like that. And I was like, look at they're all playing with their friends. That's so cool. And Professor <laughs> Lady goes, they're mortal enemies. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, it was dope, man. I, I really no issues with the match. To be yeah, honest. I don't either. I don't either. And I do agree that I don't think it needs as many weapons, but I understand that why they might want to. And like I said, I think visualization of violence was important. I thought the handcuff spot was terrible. Cause it made no sense and it wasn't yeah. used. She Nikki shows the handcuffs, throws them in the ring and doesn't come back to the very specific spot where she's supposed to have them. Now she loosely puts them on Alexa and then they do a spot that doesn't really require them. Doesn't they are chained together and then minutes later, not even minutes later, it was like a minute later, the finish happens. Alexa slips out and walks over, and that's that. Right. There's just, unless you're doing a specific, potentially specific uh, call to, hey, we were tied together and now we're not, like as a personal symbolism, it wasn't story. Specific. I think, I think you can actually see Jessica Carr take the keys out of the, out of her pocket to undo the handcuffs in that moment. It's possible. I don't think that there was any part of me that believed Alexa was stuck in that handcuff. Right. Well, that too. Yeah. It was very, very loose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I think it's great. Oh, also, Nikki Cross's gear was so dope. She put little uh, parts of all of her past in there. Um, her oh, jacket. I didn't, I didn't notice that. I'll have to take a look. It was so dope, dude. The The jacket, the back of it had the Sanity logo. The side of it had the corset strings because she used to wear a corset when she was in Sanity. The front of it was the um, ASH butterfly, but the center of the butterfly had the Sanity logo in it as well. Like, gotcha. here's parts of who she okay. is okay. taking it to the next level. Kind of makes me excited nice. for the potential of what, what she could do. Um, But overall, the good guys won in there. Becky stands tall, looks like a badass. You got Bianca. I hope Bianca's not really hurt did we see her on raw she was talking shit in the back that was it right yeah yeah they alluded to the fact that oscar uh um bianca and alexa were too injured to perform because mia yim had wrestled uh as well yeah uh, earlier on raw yeah and uh there was the and uh, um dakota wrestled against candace We'll talk about that in a bit. So the final thing in Survivor Series was, in fact, the War Games match with the men, with the Bloodline, Bloodline getting the victory. This felt like, A, they tried really hard to make you think that Drew McIntyre's better than everybody ever, and I just don't see it. Uh, but two, it felt like an entire match that was designed to get to the last. Like, I mean, they're all designed to get to the finish, right? But it felt really like you could throw away everything before the last two minutes of the match and you'd be fine. That's like, exactly what I was going to say. That's exactly Go what I was going to say. Because when you said, when you not the whole concept, but when you said about Drew better than everyone else, what I was going to say was until the last three minutes. Because I had said last week on episode one that how do you get all these big guys, all these brawling brutes, for lack of a better term. But, I mean, these, these guys are massive. They're made of venters. How do you get all these heavyweights out of the match so somebody can take a pinfall? And then as as the match was wrapping up, I was like, wait a second. What was the spot that took out Sheamus? What was the spot that took out Drew? I don't I don't remember those spots. But flawless execution beforehand. I mean, the match was just so insane. I thought it was incredible. I thought it was incredible. And if you ditched me, then what I will say is having Jay start the match is seems to be like this new thing where Jay is now back to main eventing. I don't know if this is that Ro- uh, Roman rumor thing where he's not going to be on many TVs or pay-per-views going forward. Um, but main event Jay Uso was fucking phenomenal and him and Butch were incredible together to start. And I'm curious if Jay really did uh, break his hand because he seemed to hurt himself early in the um, uh, war games match as well. I don't believe he broke his hand and I didn't believe he broke his hand there either. And I don't think he would have wrestled on raw if he had. 
He was punching with it and stuff. Like, why would you do that if you had an actual broken hand? I mean, and selling it too, though. He was selling it. Yeah, he was selling it because I think that was the story. Was that his hand was injured, and that's why Sammy had to step in because he's fucking the... awesome too. Yeah. <laughs> well, the story is that Jay was too hurt to finish up the match, and Sammy stepped in to do it. Sammy stepped up as the honorary ooze to make sure this got done. Because Jay being the right hand man, the main event Jay Uso, yeah, he is kind of going back to that like I can step in for Roman when needed, you know. Um, but yeah, there were no spots in there that really took out anybody. They just all of a sudden were down there, and then I mean, you could even see parts were. I mean, they're basically back there, just kind of waiting. You know what I mean, like. So yeah, the whole match was was good, but it was really the last two minutes that mattered. And the Sammy and Roman and KO and Jay stuff was sick. One of the big things coming out of it, though, people are asking about. They all thought it was going to be Jay and Sammy who were going to turn on each other. And now the belief is that they won't because they hugged. So I've seen people throw around Solo's name. Do you think Solo was sent by the elders to get Roman in check? Um, that's fantasy booking and I don't do that. The story that the bloodline is on, as we talked about in the beginning of this episode one is something to not think about it ending. Like who cares? Who cares yeah. how it's going to end? It's, it's yeah. everything that even, so take that, that whole Sammy's going to do this or Jay's going to do that. How did this war games match end with, with Sammy sacrificing his best friend for the family like yes it's the story is in front of us it's not what's on the next couple pages the story in front of us is being told so well how what do you 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 don't sit in the middle of a movie theater guessing the ending why would you do that yeah i yeah when people were speculating that too i was like i don't see it but uh, we're not there yet either way so I, i don't know like, like I'm every happy with awesome. every single story is possible. You can have it be Jay. Honestly, you can have it be Jimmy. Why can you have it be Jimmy? Because nobody said, "Hey, it might be Jimmy," right? Like, yeah. And I think there's a lot of ways to go with it. Although I do think it's a little weird by having the big hug and everything at the end. Is it did feel a lot like a reset, like that we've gone this far with Sammy and Jay, and now it's all like that chapter's closed. We're starting fresh again. So it's got this kind of like. I mean, it feels a little bit like starting over, which kind of sucks in a way, because I really liked where that was all kind of going and I liked the tension and everything. But in another way, it's also like, all right, cool. Let's see what this next story is. It felt like um, a season finale and not a series finale. You know what I mean? Sure. I think everyone's trying sure. to everyone's trying to to guess the series finale. And I don't know how many seasons the show's going to go for, you know? Right. Right. And that's that's a good thing. Yeah. Because the writing's not on the wall. Everybody wants to take their own pencil and write on their wall, but there's no writing on the wall that is the bloodline. That's its own thing with somebody else's pencil. Yeah. You don't get to write on that wall. You know, you don't you don't get to make that up. So whatever's happening is is like I said, it's it's happening in front of us. I look, there's a chance that the solo theory comes true. I mean, why did people say that though? Right? Because he's standing at the end of war games with his arms crossed not with the ones up, yeah, you know, but he was Sammy's first supporter. So why would he be jealous of Sammy now? Yeah. You know, it's not, it's, you got to watch the whole thing, remember the whole thing and go through the whole thing and see what's in front of us. Sammy being integrated like this, not only, because at least what I thought on Monday, not only did it solidify his spot in the bloodline, but it put him in a spot where he doesn't have to prove himself and overdo it anymore. He is now a part of the bloodline and he is going to integrate and interweave in what everyone's doing instead of try to stand out to prove himself. Yeah. And I loved all the story going into it with the SmackDown back and forth with Kevin talking to Sammy, like, Hey, if it was me, I wouldn't give them the chance to turn on me. I would strike first Jay over listening and being like, who'd you talk to? Nobody. Jay going to Roman. He lied to me. Roman saying, bring in Sammy. Why'd you lie to him? Cause he's always on edge. Of course. I'm not trying to get him all riled up for no reason. Like all of that was just so right. expertly done so much. So as we move into raw. Well, and real quick, him telling oh. him telling the direct truth to Roman. Yes. 
So he didn't not only did he did he not lie to Roman, but he didn't tell Roman anything that we didn't see. Yes. You know, everything we saw he admitted to. So mm-hmm. that that to me supplanted he's not turning on them. Mm-hmm. He didn't leave anything out. Like again, they're they're not they're yeah. not showing you that this is gonna break up. They're showing you that Sammy's intentions are pure. He just yeah. has to learn how to navigate these guys until yeah. he gets accepted. Yeah. Um and I know it's jumping around through Raw a little bit because it wasn't at the top of the show, but we did end up with the bloodline and Kevin Owens. Dude, that promo back and forth with Sammy and KO. When I got home from work, it had already aired. I watched like the last hour and a half and then go watch the beginning of it toward the end. There was a whole thing. Sorry, I have to watch it. Well, as soon as I walked in, Patricia is like, wait till you see Kevin and Sammy. She's like, it gave me chills, actual chills. And as I was watching it, Dude, Kevin is so fucking good. And the subtleties of Sammy is so high level. When when KO is like, you know, I'm so happy that the crowd is able to see what I've always seen in you. Like, I love that for you, that they're able to know now what I've always known. And he goes, but everything between you and me, I don't, I don't want any of it. I don't want to ride with you. I don't want to team with you. I don't want to fight with you. The look that Sammy gave where he's like listening and kind of looks at the other guys and kind of does this like he looks shook by it, but also trying right. not to look too shook by it. Like because it was kind of funny and um I don't shout him out too much, but I do listen to the Cornet podcast from time to time and he mentioned the that they might be leading towards like a Sammy and KO thing, and he goes, Those two those two guys from the till the day they die will want to fight each other again. He's like, they're just so intertwined with who they are. So like the fact that we all see that as audience members anyways, like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn one-on-one, I can't imagine any instance where you put that in front of them and they go, I don't know. (laughs) You know what I mean? So for him to just come off so believable in that, I don't even want to fight you is like, it was awesome, dude. Like I was super into it. And because they've built that trust on our side for so long, Part of me is all like, there's no way. There's no way they're not in the ring again at some point. But right. if I'm WWE, I stretch that out as far as possible. Well, that's that's it. That's what they just laid out there is that Sammy's the the final boss to get to Roman. Because KO said it. He's like, I, I didn't say I was done fighting the bloodline. Yeah. So he's going to go through the Usos and Solo. And he's going to say, I took out the rest of the bloodline. And Sammy's like, you're not you didn't take out me. Yeah, I'm not going to fight you anymore. Well, if you want to get to Roman, you got to go through me. And yeah. that'll be probably at Roadblock before WrestleMania or what have you. Um, it'll be great. It'll be great because, yeah. yeah, they they are amazing together. Yeah. Dude. When I saw them wrestle at a house show, it was the worst seven minutes of all time because it was only seven minutes. And I remember it was only seven minutes because I wanted 45 minutes and they gave yeah. me seven. And I was like, wait, it's done? It was only seven minutes. Yeah. 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 So good. Uh, show did open up with Becky Lynch. She comes out there. She talks some shit. She goes into the crowd. She meets Bob. She meets Zach. What's up, Bob? Shout out to Bob. Big shouts to Bob. Bailey comes out, says Bob sucks. I'm inclined Bob to believe Bailey. Suck. Well, Becky had a good argument. Bob yeah. is not <laughs> Dude, it's our it's our it's our faves going against each other. I know. It's uh kind of crazy too, because like I've wanted that for so long. And now that we're like on the cusp of it, I'm like, this is what I want for WrestleMania. I don't care if anything else ever happens on Mania. I want Becky versus Bailey one on one. Proper. Proper. Yeah. Yeah. But also like I don't know how to call that one. I think you'll both be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like it. Some, what was it? Uh, Bianca said in the interview, she goes, uh, Bailey's going to get her WrestleMania moment someday. And I was all like, bitch, she started with the WrestleMania moment. Her first WrestleMania, she retained the championship. She was the first woman to ever retain a championship at WrestleMania. WrestleMania 33. I was like, she's had a WrestleMania moment. She's gifting them out now. <laughs> like... But it's not what she meant. I know. 
I know. But I don't know, dude. I think it's sick. The two of them going back and forth on the mic. Amazing. They've got such good chemistry for so many good reasons. I don't know. I don't want to like, say too much, but I'm into this. Well, I honestly, it's we haven't seen this Bailey versus this Becky, right? No. Like, I'm uh, looking up real quick. The last time they wrestled was SmackDown 2019. Was the last time right. they had a one on one match? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were in a triple threat match with Shayna Baszler in 2019 as well. Survivor Series, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in NXT in 2015 yeah. was the last time that they was the other time I should say. So yeah, that's the only yeah, other time they wrestled. Couple. Yeah. So this is it. Like this is our our turn. You know, our turn that we have a returning Bailey who is, I think, slowly coming back into where she was with Sasha. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't think she's fully back. No offense. Um, but this Becky as well, who the man, big, the man, somewhat the mix between the man and big time Bex is the best Becky, right? It's, yeah. it's both. It's not, I'm too big for the show, goat Becky, but I am the best that's here, Becky. You know, like a good mix of that. And yes. I think that's what we're going to kind of get because even commentary alluded to that on, on Saturday. So, if that's the Becky we get, if this is the Bailey we get, you're right, man. Push this shit in a way till Mania. Let the rest of Damage Control do what they want to do and have these two fucking go after it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into it. We'll see how it goes. That was kind of a highlight for me for the night. I did see some people say this, and I want to know what you thought. Someone said this was the best Raw that they've seen since Triple H has taken over. No, but it was. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was a really good Raw. I mean, but can I can I tell you which Raw was the best Raw since Triple H took over? No, because that's not how I track my Raws. I thought it was a good Raw. I had I liked it. Even even the opening of the show being this way, and Mm -hmm. then having uh, Mia Yim and Ray Ripley turn into a mixed tag match. That was cool. Which was probably the most fluid it's ever happened, and it to be and it to be a mixed tag. Oh, by the way, the first hour of Raw was commercial free. Um, yeah, I, I liked it. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty sick. Kevin Owens versus Jey Uso was incredible to close the show. Um, Street Fighter versus the Alpha Academy. I did not need. So here, did you watch the full match? No. Okay. Watch the match if mm. you if you want if you want. Don't. <laughs> Here's the thing. The match starts out exactly how you don't want it to start out with the street profits doing what the street profits do. And the fact that they've been gone for this long and show zero development in how they want to start out a match. It's like, yeah, come that's on. That's when I stopped watching it. And that's the, that's the problem. It's Montez Ford doing a, you know, and if you get in the ring, I'll beat you up too. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? Like you're, you don't have to be, he's too charismatic for his own self. His character yeah. is way, way above his actual in-ring ability. He's super athletic, yes, but there is a thing called wrestling. Like, not all great athletic dunkers are fantastic basketball players. Not all yeah. home run hitters can play the field. Like, it's there's there's a, a sport to this whole thing that has to has to click together. Um, but the the beginning and the end were typical street profits. And it's it's not good from a viewing standpoint. Taking in the middle where they're selling for Alpha, um, where they're doing moderately uh, tandem offense to Alpha Academy, really good, really solid. But the way that they present themselves at the start and the finish hasn't changed, and it's way too over the fucking top. Yeah, way too over they're... the top. But it was a solid match. It was a solid match from from There's Alpha two... Academy. Sorry, from Alpha Academy. Yeah, too too obnoxious for me to watch. Oh, I did want to say this about Mia and Rhea. They worked much better together than Mia's been working with most most of the people so far. Dude, it was they awesome. Clicked. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, and it's one of those things that I used to say about Charlotte. Um, how you know you would say, well, Charlotte always makes sure Charlotte looks good. She doesn't allow that opponent. Ray Ripley did everything she could to help Mia Yim come out the end of this, 
looking just as good as Ray Ripley. And yep. Ray has been on TV for like four fucking years straight. And Mia Yim has just come back to Raw. Mia Yim shouldn't look as good as Rhea, but did. And that yeah. fucking added the Riptide into a DDT. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. Fucking Sick. awesome. And they they tried to play into it at the end of the match. And Rhea still gets the pin on Mia. With her. I was like, we're good. This is awesome. Yeah. Hell yeah. So good. Uh, I really like all the theory and Seth Rollins stuff. I think that's a... This is going to be fire. Um, The second oh, I... No, go ahead. Gable did the roll through German suplex with Dawkins. Nice. It's a lot yeah. of weight. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> it looked fluid. Absolutely fluid. Yeah. Gable's a monster. but Gable's in- insanely good. Yeah. That's my problem with the way that they've been booking Alpha Academy. Is every time you watch Gable and Otis really do what they can do, you go, God damn, I forgot how amazing they are. Then they come out and they do stuff and you go, oh, yeah, they're not that good. Oh, yeah, they lost again. And then in the middle of another match, it's like, oh, my God, I forgot how fucking amazing these guys are. Like, I just wish they would be booked like they weren't losers because in the middle of a match, they'll make magic every time. And then they have to slow it down, bring it down, start to lay off because they yeah. have to make sure the other team looks like they won on purpose. And uh, they're just too good. So it's like... like- I get it. For for me to watch wrestling and enjoy, it, and again, problems I have with others like a Shotzi, right? Gable has complete understanding of his character. Yeah. He has complete understanding of his character on the microphone when he's in the ring by himself, when he's in interviews, when he's across from other people. He also has the ability to relieve the character to perform wrestling, but then also interject the character in his wrestling. So when yeah. he does a drop toe hold into a headlock, he can hit the thank you. Yeah. Like That's character work inside of wrestling. And to your point, when Montez does that, it's like, dude, you're the baby face. We don't need to see you do that. Um, The the last couple of things I'll say about Gable, because I did tweet it out. I was like, Gable's in his own right now. He he's full ownership of what he's doing. He does no wrong. When the street profits first came in and they were like, and the street profits are up and we want the shoes. The fucking Gable comes in and steamrolls it. It was fucking amazing. And, but again, to their credit, how they perform, including Otis, opposite of how the Street Profits, because a lot of people look at it and go, oh, Street Profits really shitted on Alpha Cat. They have to allow that. Yeah. The way Otis ad libs to Gable, they're, they're doing so great. And I mentioned it earlier how fucking Alpha Academy wants a rematch. And it's like, Otis didn't get a chance to take his shirt off. Like, this is a 15-minute match, man. Like, what, yeah. what are these excuses? But it's it's what he's yeah. doing, and it's it's phenomenal. So, shouts to Gable. Uh, he deserves everything. Yeah. Um, the second I see Dexter, Miz, or Gargano, I stop watching at this point, so I didn't see any of that. But it looks like Dexter won and got a contract, which I'm supposed to believe. He's been on the show weekly for six months without contract in a world that they specifically outline uh, how they don't use talent without contract. Uh, and the story being that they were chasing him out consistently. I was just, it was, it's all just yeah. so dumb and yeah. overacted that I just had nothing to do with it. Uh, did, was there any of it that you found redeemable? I saw he Not, gave money to children. That was cool. Yeah, but it was for the sake of yes. getting the money taken away by the Miz and then given back by Johnny. So it was oh. gratuitous. Yeah, it's, there was a lot that had to do with Johnny because uh, he comes out for the save afterwards. Um, Oh, you know what? That was um, high level stupid where Johnny holds up Dexter's hand and points to him looking out into the crowd like I'm putting over Dexter. Just so you know, I'm endorsing Dexter like you have made anything of yourself on the main roster for that to be anything at all. Like you don't have enough credibility with the audience to put over anybody in that way. There's no Johnny Gargano rub for Dexter. You're not the rock holding up Roman's arm at the end of Rumble and looking and at how the did crowd that work? saying, that didn't even work. Right. If The Rock's not going to get someone over, how's Johnny going to get someone over? Yeah. It doesn't work it that made, way. It made me like Johnny less. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, this pompous, arrogant piece of shit. <laughs> it, I, I have no problem with any talent trying to show me I should root for them. Go for yes. it. Win me over. I told you. When... When Charlotte got suspended and came back, I felt there was a little bit of character shift in her. That was like, oh, let's see where this goes. Three weeks later, she was the same one. It didn't work. You know, there's always a chance to get 
to get the audience on your side in any way, shape, or form to over boo you or over cheer you. And it's just not happening. You're presenting Johnny as if he's someone I'm supposed to give a fuck about. Yes. And the difference between him and Candace is that Candace goes out and wrestles, puts on a fucking clinic without pandering the reactions from the crowd, not to the crowd. Hey, you want, you got to root me this way, you know, instead of saying, yeah, guys, let's clap along. You know, like yeah. Johnny's trying to like, Hey, you guys, right. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Candace does her thing and is awesome. Yes. And then she brings the kid on TV afterwards. And I'm like, Oh, come on. You got to just fucking I don't like triple H that. loves them, man. Yeah. It's crazy. But and yeah, with the Johnny, Candace Dakota match, yeah. I don't need to see Candace defeating Dakota Kai. She's half of the women's tag team champions. Diamond Control is already being booked poorly. They're constantly being defeated, even when they're teamed up. That This didn't win Candace over for me. It felt like another Candace being forced on me the way that Johnny is. Like you said, Triple H loves them. Yeah. And I'd really like to see Damage Control look strong and let someone brand new to the company like Candace work her way towards damage control and not just dominate them anyways. Well, not only that, another thing that really fucked with me on that one, that makes Dakota at best the seventh best woman on the roster because yes. she lost to five of them in war games. And then someone who wasn't in war games on Monday. Yes. Yep. That's what I mean. It just undermines that much more about uh, damage control in general and Dakota in general. Yeah. 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 Uh, what were you going to try to say? Yeah, just undermines them beating Becky in the beginning, or punching her in the beginning. Oh, yeah, they chased off oh, Becky yeah. to begin with, and then now they're just getting their asses handed on by Candace. So you have Dakota and EO are threats to Becky, sort of. But even then, three on one, and they couldn't take down Becky? Like, right. damage control looks really weak. Three of us can't even get the better yeah. of we can't even blindside Becky. Right. And I'm not saying that Becky shouldn't be a little overpowered, but three on one shouldn't be a shoe in for Becky to come out on top. And then for them to also lose to Candace later, like yeah. damage controls booking is so bad. And I like, and it flip flops. So it yes. flip flops because they, sometimes they do look really fucking strong. They do look like they're going to no pun, like create a shit ton of damage. And then, yeah. like you like you guys just said, the attack of Becky to not come out on top and then also Dakota losing, it's like, well, what the fuck? Yeah. Also yeah. funny that EO is fighting in a neck brace. Yeah, it was funny. I liked it. That made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I don't know what we're doing here. We really think that, but okay. Um, That was it, though. That was everything, man. I mean, I still think it was a really good chunk of shows and stuff. I don't know. Was there anything else on Raw that we were missing here? Probably um, some sort of segment. The Jey Uso KO match. Yeah. Um, I, th I was like, well, what's going to come on after this? Because they gave him a shit ton of time. But it was yeah. awesome. And Jey Uso's super kick might be the best in the business. And I'll tell you yeah. why. His sidekick comes from many different angles and many different directions for the sake of making proper jaw con contact, not for the sake of his move. Yeah. Like when Johnny comes out and super kicks the Miz, he does it from so far away. I don't even think he hits him, but there's yeah. a spot where Jay Uso has to like throw an uppercut super kick to KO to get it on the right spot of the chin. And I was like, you know what? For as many people as do super kicks, which is basically all of them, Jay yeah. Uso's has to be the best. He is fucking incredible at throwing the kick and landing it in the right spot. Yeah. And it's just a, a nuance in his wrestling that I, I think I, a lot of people don't pay attention to. Yeah, he's amazing. They're, the super kicks from the Usos both are the most believable, I think, it, apart from uh, Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler's got a sick super kick too. But outside of those guys, like I wish most everyone else would stop. Yeah. KO's yeah. got a good one. I like KO's because it comes out when he needs to use it. Not yes. as a transition move. Because like even the Usos, Correct. they use it as a transition move a lot. But when they do it, like I said, they, they do it to the area of the body that it needs to hit. To and go it also to the slows next down thing. the match. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Like it's to slow it down. Or like KO does it to stop some offense. The Usos yeah. use it as transitional, but to slow down an onslaught. Where a lot of other guys who use it, it's literally just another move. I'll bounce off the ropes. I'm back over here. Right. I'll do this. And like... right. It doesn't. It doesn't even stutter the pace. 
of the match. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of like a punch. They use it more as a not a, not as a punch as a, like a an elbow instead of a punch. Like I keep punch yeah. you punch a boom. Here's an elbow. Okay, now you fucking stop. <laughs> you know they, they yeah, throw yeah. that. Yeah, they throw their their side kicks or super kicks at a moment to to really slow things down. Yeah, when I saw that, I was like, man, this 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 is this is how it's supposed to be done. And I'm wondering. I was listening to another podcast and they were talking about, you know, if you're, if you're labeling wrestlers in, you know, who, who are best wrestlers. Yeah. And it's like, you know, well, where's Gunther today. Right. Cause of how yeah. incredible he is. Like the top 10 is only 10 people. Right. Like, and you, yeah. you got to start with, you know, Roman and, you know, guys like Seth and, you know, fuck is Bobby Lashley, what he's done this year, like all these things. And then I watch this match and I go, like, of course Jay Uso has to be a tag team. But like, like even he said it earlier in the night, like main event Jay Uso, if that's who you want. Like, I'm like, fuck, man. Main event Jay Uso is really fucking good at wrestling. Yes. Really fucking good at wrestling. Like, as 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 good as some solo stars can be tag wrestlers on presentation alone, he is a hundred times better a singles wrestler coming out of a tag team than maybe any. And I mean, Gable's probably the other one. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. So good. good. Uh, Anything you want to put over before we do last call? Uh, You know, we talked a little bit earlier uh, before we started about the refereeing nowadays. Yeah. And, I wanted to say something after Crown Jewel about how Asia Smith or Aja Smith or Daphne um, has been performing because the mm-hmm. spots, the spots in Saudi period with the women have evolved so much yeah. from full length bodysuits and T-shirts to gear that yeah. honestly is flattering, maintains their characters and all the shit. And uh, I believe Jessica Carr was the first one to be a ref. Uh, a woman ref in Saudi. And this mm-hmm. one, the past uh, Saudi show had multiple matches with these women. And I'm like, this is yep. fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, but there's something about the way uh, ref Asia performs that. And I'll just say it compare Like she's the exact opposite of Aubrey where Aubrey mm-hmm. is always in the way. It, you know, that's, it's, it's a match, you know, it's an Asia match. Cause she's not in the way Yeah. that the performers can really shine. And when something needs to happen, she's so emphatic. She's so athletic. She's fucking amazing, man. And she's starting to to retweet lately a lot of the support she's getting. And I've said it on my podcast, Terrible Wrestling Takes, uh, and many times, probably well over a year ago, if not two years ago at the very beginning of the show, on how much I loved her as an athlete, as a referee. Now, though, as a performer, as a referee, I think she's fucking flawless. And yeah. and when you guys see her as a referee in the match, you probably won't recognize her there until the end of the match because that's what she's supposed to do. She's yeah. supposed to let the performers really, really go and enforce the rules. And I think she's probably, for me, I want her refing Rock Roman. Yeah. I want her to be the one that I think she's the best referee in the business today. So shouts to, to referee... Asia Smith, Aja Smith, or as she told me, it's Daphne. So, yeah, yeah, no, she's fantastic. I think her and Jessica are two of the best refs that are out there right now in general. There's a lot of really good refs right now. It was really funny. We saw, um, who was it that just grew out a beard? Just kind of made us laugh. Um, but uh, yeah, it was Jason Ayers. Just grew out a full beard all of a sudden. Like hadn't been on TV for it. Comes back with a full beard, and I was like, <laughs> what the? They let you guys have beards because I want to know about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm invested in this one. Uh, but yeah, Aja is, is incredible out there. Like when her and Jessica are both in the ring, they have control over the match the way that others do not. And they have control over the scenarios that others do not. Like they are able to maintain uh, that, that sort of uh, authority that we need refs to have and they are given that respect. And I think part of it is that in, in forms of authority. And I saw it when I worked law enforcement, men typically give women more respect than they will just give over to men in similar fields. 
And I think it's because for whatever reason, people see like their mom and their sister and their daughters and stuff where when they see another man, they just think of another guy. So I do think that that way I used to see it in law enforcement has trickled over into the refereeing aspect in this particular company. Cause I don't see it in the others where there's a certain respect that's just given to them and it comes off fantastic because it's utilized. You know what I mean? Like we don't want to get the ref in the way we don't want a ref bump. We don't want to knock out. We got to be careful of them. We respect them, all that stuff, you know? Um, and yeah, I think I just fantastic. She's incredible. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's all I got. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm excited yeah. to see what's coming up next. I mean, with no December PLE uh, and everything's the road to Royal Rumble, I'll be interesting to see how things kind of kind of fray out from here. I'm really excited about what's coming up there too. Uh, also, you can support us in other ways as well. You can check out youtube.com slash queen of carnage for all the Medusa content that I do. And I uh, work with John Arezzi on Pro Wrestling Spotlight. You can check that out at youtube.com slash pro wrestling spotlight. Uh, outside of that, we got Curable coming through. You can use promo code Mad Thanks and PWS. Either one of those promo codes will get you 20% off any order of CBD, uh, Delta 8, Delta 9, uh, dog treats, bath bombs, whatever you need. If you've got any aches, pains, anxieties, uh, it helps with all that stuff. Um, worth checking out it was a really good product i really enjoyed it i really like their teas um but outside of that i think we're gonna be back tomorrow night here in the die bar of the iwc for a brand new episode one with uh me and miss amanda jane talking aew she just texted me today and said i need to see ricky's youtube promo and i'll be honest if ricky keeps doing a bunch of stuff on youtube doesn't help me like him more on tv <laughs> they need to put it on tv but we'll talk about that tomorrow night right here in the die bar of the iwc Bishop, thanks for coming through and being my drinking buddy. That's the last call. You got it. Cheers. Hey, producer lady here. Thanks for tuning in. Continue to support us or buy us a drink by following and putting the I in subscribe on Twitch. Or subscribe and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us. Cheers. I would never have a drink with wrestling on the rocks.